Hello and welcome. My name is Hannah Jane Condell, and I'm an associate prof professor at the University of Wyoming. And today we're coming to you from the University of Wyoming campus here in Laramie, Wyoming, where we just concluded Habitable Worlds 2017, a system science workshop. This was a week-long conference supported in part by NASA. Throughout this week, we have been having cross-disciplinary discussions between astronomers, planetary scientists, Earth scientists and others about what kinds of planets might be capable of supporting life and how we might be able to actually find them. I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Tasker of JAXA, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, who will be moderating today's panel discussion about habitability and life in the universe. Thank you very much. So we have now found over three and a half thousand exoplanets, planets orbiting stars beyond our own sun. And roughly one third of these have sizes that are less than about twice the size of the Earth. So this has led to the next inevitable question. Could any of these actually be a habitable planet? So with me today, I have three scientists who are working on this exact issue with NASA. On my far left, I have Jada Ani, an astrobiologist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Next to her is Andrew Rushby, a NASA Nexus postdoctoral fellow in residence at NASA Ames and co-host of the ExoCast podcast. And on my right, I have Aki Roberge, astrophysicist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and the study scientist for the Louvois Survey Concept Study. So let's start uh, with a question about habitability itself. This is a term that we all have some familiarity with, but what does it really mean when we talk about a habitable exoplanet? Well, I suppose I'll start since I have a mic. When we think about habitability in terms of exoplanets, what we're really thinking about is planets that have liquid water on their surface, because we know that liquid water is a requirement of all life on Earth. And so this is our starting point for when we start to think about what habitability might mean elsewhere in the galaxy. Um, yes, and so we're, we're very focused on the question of, of liquid water, because as Giada said, it seems essential. But I guess it's important to understand that it, that is probably a necessary but not sufficient condition for a planet to actually be have a living biosphere. So, and we're only really just actually starting to understand all the different factors that come into play that make the Earth habitable over billions and billions of years. Yeah, as, as Aki mentioned, when we look at, when we think about a habitable planet, we really only have one to go on, and that's the Earth. Um, so usually when we frame a question about habitability, it's thinking about an Earth-like planet. It's sometimes used um, in place of that, that phrase. So liquid water is important. Having an atmosphere that's something like the Earth is, is sometimes considered to be important, but again, not a necessary prerequisite. Um, so it's a very complex and interconnected phrase that actually has a lot to unpack. Now, when we hear about exoplanet discoveries on the news, we often hear this term habitable zone. Now, what does this actually mean when we are looking for exoplanets and considering their properties? It's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, the habitable zone, okay. In a, in a straight up definition, probably it is, it is the region around a star where a planet might be able to have liquid water on its surface. Or I think somebody at this workshop put it differently a few days ago. It's um, outside of the habitable zone, we know that the planets cannot have liquid water on their surface. So it, it's basically a balance between um, uh, how much the, the light coming from the star, it would warm you up, and um, how much you radiate away, how much the planet radi you know, radiates away. So it's sort of like a, it's like a it's like a it's like a warm zone around a campfire. So if you have a really bright you have a really bright star, you know the habitable zone would move away from the star to cool things down, so it didn't get too hot. If you have a really small, cool star, like um, what what we call M dwarf stars, the habitable zone has to sort of huddle in towards the campfire just to keep the planet warm. And it, it's it's um it's probably not the only place, obviously, though, around a star that you could have liquid water or maybe habitable conditions. It, it is basically, though, probably the only kind of planet, planets in the habitable zone 
Exoplanets in the habitable zone with liquid water on their surface are probably the only kind of habitable environment that we'll be able to detect, that we will be able to see from interstellar distances. Yeah, that's a great description. The astronomical observable nature of this is, is what makes it very useful. But just to build on to um, what you said about small stars and larger stars and how that affects the distance, um, this distance also changes over time as the star itself you know, ages. So uh, the red dwarf stars that Aki mentioned, they, um, they uh, evolve very slowly. So they may have um, habitable zones that are relatively stable in time and space. Um, whereas sun-like stars, um, like the sun, um, they actually evolve relatively quickly in astronomical terms, which means their habitable zone um, kind of moves outwards over time, um, which has implications for any planets that we might be considering to be habitable within those zones. Yeah, all of that is great. And in addition to that, I would just emphasize the practicality of the definition of the habitable zone. The habitable zone allows us to focus our searches when we start to look for life on distant planets. It gives us a place for where we can start looking, where we know that this condition of surface liquid water is possible. And so it's, it's useful from a pragmatic standpoint because it allows us to, you know, not have to search everywhere, but just search in a smaller area around the star. So what we're saying is the habitable zone is more like a searching zone for finding possible habitable planets, as opposed to offering any guarantee that a planet within the habitable zone will in fact be habitable. Absolutely, yes. Now, based on what Aki said about how it has to be like this warm region around the star, um, I think we've assumed Earth-like conditions for changing that radiation the planet's receiving at that campfire point to what the surface conditions will be like. Uh, so that means that the surface conditions on the planet, if they're not like Earth, could be quite different. So what do we know currently about surfaces of these exoplanets? Approximately nothing. <laughs> um, <clears throat> right now, the, the, the techniques that we use to discover exoplanets today, um, they're, they're, they're what we call indirect techniques. So what we're actually doing, we're not so much, we're not so much seeing the planet itself, we're seeing the impact, the effect of that planet on its host star. And so, for example, one of the most uh, common techniques is the transit technique. So this is when, um, if, you're, uh, do, if I remember the transit of... Uh, uh, Venus that happened uh, not too long ago, but um, if we have the right orientation to the, to the system, sometimes a planet will pass in front of its star and we'll see a dip in its light. And that's how like uh, the, the vast majority of exoplanets have been discovered to date. But as far as, and we get their size from that measurement and in, with other techniques we can get maybe a mass, but that's mostly what we've got right now. So really, um, Exoplanets right now are largely small black shadows to us. And we really, to, to find out what they're really like, we need to turn those small black shadows into a rainbow of colored dots in the sky and actually start to understand what they are like. Yeah, and I, I love that answer, and I love the phrase small black shadows. And one of the ways that we're starting to prepare for making these observations of exoplanets that would turn them into rainbow dots is using models to try to predict what their um, surfaces and atmospheres might be made out of so that we can anticipate what we might be looking for. That's a great point, and I'm pleased you brought up atmospheres, actually, because um, I future missions are probably going to be able to give us some information about planetary atmospheres. And from the, the lessons we've learned about the Earth, we know that the atmosphere and the surface and the oceans are intimately connected. And if we can determine something about the composition of the atmosphere, we might be able to say something about what's going on in the surface of the planet or in its oceans, if it has any oceans, or even in its interior. Um, so at the moment, yes, we know approximately nothing about their surfaces, especially of the small planets. Um, but that might change very soon. So to really discover if these small black shadows in the habitable zone are Earth-like enough that liquid water could exist on their surface, we need to get a glimpse of what's going on down there. Uh, what future missions do we have in the works that will give us a bit more information? All right, so first up uh, coming uh, is the, will be the James Webb Space Telescope. So this is um, NASA's next uh, really sort of a large strategic mission, uh, launch date in, we are in 20, it's in 2018, 2019. Um, 
It is a it is a large six and a half meter telescope diameter telescope. It will observe at infrared wavelengths. So these are heat, this is heat radiation basically, um, and it was not in fact originally um, planned or designed to study planets around other stars, um, but it can and it can do it will be able to do it quite well and it will it will be our first um, our first uh, real tool that will allow us to uh, actually probe the atmospheres of a lot of planets around other stars. Um, a lot of warm Jupiter-sized planets and warm Saturns, Neptunes, and probably down to what we would call super-Earths. So um, planets that are, you know, a little, you know, a couple of times more uh, bigger than the Earth. So that's, that's, what's, that's the first thing coming up. But um, it will... The, the James Webb Space Telescope it will study the atmospheres of exoplanets by um, measuring the light when, it, when, a, when a planet passes in front of its star. It'll measure the light that passed through the atmosphere of the planet, and it's, that's called transit spectroscopy. Um, I, we think that if we really want to get down to those true Earth twins, those Earth-sized planets around sun-like stars, um, we, we're probably going to need a different technique where we finally just block out the star, like putting your hand over the star to see something faint right next to it and actually take a real picture of the planet. Um, so, and see it as hopefully pale blue dots. Um, and so, but to do that, you have to suppress the light from that bright star by 10 billion times. That's a lot. And, but we, we we, have, I, we think we know how to do this. There are instruments called coronagraphs and others called star shades um, that are being developed by NASA. Um, and what's coming up next is on the, uh, the W-first mission uh, that is supposed to launch in the uh, sort of mid-2020s will carry NASA's first really advanced coronagraph into space. So this is a technology demonstration instrument um, that will uh, hopefully advance, advance this technique, this hardware, this tool, to the point where, after that, we will be able to, uh, to design and build um, some of these other mission concepts that uh, we've been talking about this week. Um, one of them is called HABEX, the Habitable Exoplanet Imaging Mission, and the other one uh, we've talked about is called LUVWAR, and that stands for Large UV Optical Infrared Surveyor, and that's, I'm the study scientist for that mission concept. Um, but both of those missions, those are really aimed, their, their killer app is to actually go out there, take pictures of those small, uh, small planets in the habitable zones of nearby sun-like stars and take, do spectroscopy on their atmospheres and find out what are the molecules in those atmospheres and maybe even see like the colors of their surfaces and maybe if they have continents or oceans and make maps and everything. So, but that's a, that's a down the road a piece. <laughs> So based on what you said, I'm hearing two different techniques for really trying to explore the surface of these planets. One is this atmosphere spectroscopy, where the starlight filters through the planet's atmosphere, and due to certain molecules in that atmosphere, certain wavelengths are missing because those molecules absorb. So you get, would you describe it as a fingerprint, perhaps, of uh, molecules in that atmosphere? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, that, that's yeah. Spectroscopy is 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 that. It's basically um, you know molecules molecules will 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 absorb will like suck up certain colors of light and different molecules you know suck up specific colors and that makes a fingerprint of that molecule in the light that you collect. So yeah. And then the second technique was actually to say, let's look at the planet directly, so direct imaging. And the challenge there is that stars are really bright and planets are really dim. So you have to use this chronograph to block out the star's light so that we can see the planet. Yeah, and, and actually there's kind of a subtle point about this too, is that, um, so the Earth's really faint. Like I said, it's 10 billion times fainter than the sun. But astronomers, we have observed things in the sky that faint before. We definitely have. So that is not, the, the real problem is how close that faint dot is to this crazy bright star. So for example, if you were looking at the Earth, at the solar system from a distance of 33 light years, the, the separation between the sun and the Earth 
is would is a um, you know 0.1 arc seconds. Okay, what is that really? That is it's approximate. That's about the width of a human hair at the distance of two football fields. <laughs> so that's what we have to do. <laughs> Great. So Elizabeth, I know we're talking about future missions and surface environments, but I feel like I should just mention the fact that. The, the Kepler space mission, which just recently ended, has got a wealth of data that's still available to be analyzed. And while we can't certainly um, see the surfaces of the planets that Kepler has detected, having a large sample of planets can provide us with a, a, a huge amount of information about their population. And we're already getting to the point where we can start noticing trends in how planets are built, where they're built, um, and while we might not be able to see their, their surfaces, we can use um, models, for example, computer simulations, with the information that we're getting from these large databases that can come from Kepler and the upcoming test mission, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, um, to um, improve our understanding of the general processes that build planets. Absolutely. So we're not done with the current data we've got, and we've got similar data coming up. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about the test mission? Um, I'm by no means an expert, um, so I, ca I can't go into any detail about it, but it will, it, it's, it's going to be a, um, a satellite that will survey, uh, a, I think, almost the entire sky um, to, it, yeah, to, to, look for, um, to look for exoplanets using the transit method that Aki um, mentioned. Um, and it's going to provide some interesting follow-up planets, almost certainly for things like James Webb and W First and the future missions, as well as adding to that, this growing pool of, um, of exoplanet statistics and data that we already have. Oh, well, those are great answers. There's, there's not a lot to add in terms of future missions, but I think it's really exciting to think about the fact that if there is a habitable planet in the nearby galaxy, we have the potential to actually know about it in just a couple years to maybe a few decades from now. And for the first time in human history, we might know that we're not alone in the universe. I think it's incredibly exciting. So that is, that is quite the goal, but here's the question. When we get these new instruments online and we're starting to see something about their surface conditions, either by looking at their atmosphere and seeing the molecules that are there, or even catching a sight of the light emitted by the planet through direct imaging, how would we know that the planet was habitable? So as we mentioned earlier, to be habitable, you need to have surface liquid water. That's central to our understanding of planetary habitability. And we can use different techniques to try to probe whether there's liquid water on the surface of an exoplanet. For example, we could look for the fingerprints of water in the light spectrum that we get from the planet. And if we see water vapor in the atmosphere, that might be a clue that there might be abundant water on the surface. We could also look for direct signs of liquid surface water. Everyone who's stood at a beach at sunset is familiar with glint when you see the sun setting and you see all the beautiful rays of light you know, scattering off the surface of the ocean. This is called glint, and we could actually look for glint on an exoplanet. You see glint most strongly when a planet is at crescent phase, so when the planet is less than halfway illuminated, that's the most optical time to see glint. And so if we were able to catch these planets during crescent phase, we might see this glint effect that would allow us to say, oh, hey, we think there's an ocean on that planet. This planet might be habitable. Another way of doing this is, again, with modeling. If we could use the spectrum or the, the fingerprint of the planet to identify greenhouse gases in that planet's atmosphere, we could then try to constrain how much greenhouse gases we think are present and then use climate models to try to infer what the likely surface temperature of that planet might be. And so that might give us a hint as to whether liquid surface water is likely to be stable on the planet. So there's, there's all sorts of different techniques that we're going to use to tackle this. That's a fantastic answer. I don't know what, I, what more I can add to it, apart from to maybe throw a bit of a spanner in the works and, um, and think about some of the outer solar system moons that we have in our solar system that aren't in the habitable zone and they don't have any surface liquid water. Um, but many planetary scientists and many folks who've been here at the conference would consider them possibly to, be, to, to host a, uh, a habitable warm liquid water ocean beneath a thick ice crust. Um, so it really speaks to the complexities of trying to 
detect habitable environments from a great distance when um, there's no surface liquid water and they're outside the habitable zone and they're very, very small moons covered in ice. Um, so it's, it's possible that we might be missing a few habitable environments in, in our search here. Yeah, I mean, that, and that reminds me of something that I often say um, when I'm, you know, talking to, the, to, to, even to astronomers actually too, just to remind everybody that the Earth is special in the solar system. Um, it's, there, there, you know, there may be other habitable environments we, even within the solar system, in the Europa, under the ice shell of Europa or Enceladus, on the moons of the outer, uh, moons around outer planets, but the Earth is the, only, is the only world in the solar system that has surface life that is so abundant, it is changing the total bulk chemistry of the whole atmosphere. And to a great extent, it's not that astronomers or astrobiologists don't think that there can be other kinds of life out there. It's just Earth-like life is probably the only kind of life that we can detect. Um, from interstellar distances. It has to be surface life, it has to be life that's so abundant that it's actually changing the atmosphere of the planet. So. so what I'm hearing is that habitability is not enough. What we're looking at is detectability of that habitability. And I think that is a, a topic that came up quite a few times at the conference. Like, yes, we could imagine these subsurface environments that could support life. But at the end of the day, if you can't detect those remotely, that is, without sending some kind of probe, then effectively the planet is uninhabitable as far as we're concerned. So what I'm also seeing is that planets are these very interconnected systems. We're looking maybe for a biological signature, but we're also going to be seeing you know, signs of the oceans, signs of the geology of the planet. And these are all intertwined, not only in the signature that we detect, but also in supporting one another and allowing biology to exist through having an active geological planet. So when we get a, a signature from the atmosphere or a glint, how do we untangle what we're seeing and maybe distinguish habitable from inhabited? What a great question. Well, it, it, it all comes back to modeling again. Planets are extremely complicated systems of many interacting processes, as you said, and it is very hard to disentangle these processes. When we look at the history of life on Earth, we see that life is inextricably linked to the conditions of our planet and the atmosphere of our planet. We are ultimately trying to search for these things called biosignatures in the atmospheres of exoplanets, which are gases that are produced by life on a planet that build up in a planet's atmosphere to detectable quantities that we could look for with our telescopes. One excellent example of a biosignature is something that we all need. We are all um, taking advantage of the fact right now that life is a planetary process because we're all breathing oxygen. And the oxygen that we're breathing was produced by life. It's produced by photosynthesis. It's, uh, you know, it's a metabolic byproduct that plant life and you know, bacterial life that photosynthesizes um, emits this oxygen that has built up in our planet's atmosphere and dramatically has you know, altered the character of our planet's atmosphere over geological timescales. And so this is what Aki was talking about earlier. When we think about life, we're really thinking about something that could modify its environment on a global level, and we're looking for those global modifications. There's some cases where it's a little bit more tricky to disentangle the biology from the non-biology. For example, there's methane in our atmosphere. Methane can be produced by both life and non-life. It can be produced by geology and biology. So if you see methane in a planet's atmosphere, it's, it's a little tricky to try to figure out where it might be coming from. But at the same time, um, life that produces methane modifies the planet's habitability because methane is a greenhouse gas. And so if you have a lot of methane producing organisms, you might actually start to produce feedbacks on the temperature of the planet. It's the same with oxygen. Oxygen actually modifies the planet's habitability because it can form ozone. So ozone in our atmosphere forms from oxygen through complicated chemistry. And ozone blocks damaging ultraviolet radiation from reaching the surface. So in a way, it uh, the oxygen in our atmosphere protects us. So it, it really is hard to disentangle all these things. They're so interconnected. It's a fantastic answer. Um, and the disentangling of life and the planet and planetary processes can even be a little bit more subtle than 
you know, the, the gases in the atmosphere. For example, if we look at the, the carbonate silicate cycle, which is a geological cycle that regulates how much CO2 is in the atmosphere, um, life affects that cycle at pretty much every stage. So uh, in the atmosphere, how, how the, the surface is weathered and how that liberates materials that are then washed into the ocean, which life in the ocean then, then, then modifies the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. At every single stage in this process, life is involved somehow. Um, and in some of my work, it's actually very difficult to remove life from this process because ideally we'd like to. We'd like to understand if uh, something like the carbonate silicate cycle could operate on a planet without life. But we only have one planet to go on, and it's very difficult to remove life. For example, plant life on the surface of, of a planet is very effective at um, accelerating chemical weathering. So that's the, the breaking down of the, of the rocks of the, of the continental crust. And this is useful because um, that material is then washed into the ocean where organisms like Forminifera, tiny little um, sea creatures, then use that to, to build their shells. And as they do that, they extract CO2 from the atmosphere. So it's, it's so difficult to remove life from, from the process. Yeah. So yeah. So I'm 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 more of an astronomer than an astrobiologist, and so for my more simple thinking about this, I, this is how I kind of how I think about what we need to do, what we're going to do. Okay. So we're gonna we're going to make as many a bunch of measurements about these exoplanets. Hopefully, what are the what are the gases in their atmospheres? What are their temp surface temperatures? Da 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 da. da. Um, we're gonna make a model and try to explain what we see, and we'll start with okay, is this physics? Mm, no. Is this chemistry? Mm, no. Okay. Still can't explain it. What's what other what other science is left in the building? Oh, biology. Ha <laughs> ha. And that's that's what we're gonna. And that is how, kind of how it's gonna be. We're gonna basically, you know, try to explain try to explain what we see with non life with physics and chemistry until we can until we fail, and then we will have succeeded in finding biosignatures. <laughs> if that is kind of how I like to think about it. Well, I, I think that's a great answer. <laughs> so uh, I see we're using the Earth a lot. I mean, we've only got, obviously, one planet. <laughs> Would you like to go here? <laughs> Sorry. So we've only got one planet where we've got um, life there, and therefore we're using the signatures that we know are coming from life and how they interact with our own geochemical cycles to help build our model. But the Earth itself has changed over time. In particular, we're talking about oxygen as a strong biosignature, but life was on the planet before it started producing oxygen. So are we able to learn not just from the current Earth, but maybe also from the early Earth? Absolutely. Early Earth is so valuable from the perspective of people trying to understand what habitability means in a more general sense. Because our planet today is just, you know, one data point, one example of what habitability might look like. But if we go back in time to Earth's past, we can actually have, you know, this array of planets that we know are possible, we know were both habitable and inhabited, and also looked radically different from the planet that we live on today. For example, if you go back on Earth before about 2.5 billion years ago, you would need to bring an oxygen tank with you because there would be no oxygen in the air for you to breathe. Instead, the atmosphere would have been more rich potentially in gases like carbon dioxide and methane produced by methane producing life. Carbon dioxide also comes out of volcanoes. Um, so the, the rise of oxygen at about 2.5 billion years ago put this you know, canonical biosignature of oxygen into our planet's atmosphere. But thinking about what habitability means in absence of that, and biosignatures in absence of that oxygen, it's really important to study early Earth. Would we recognize a planet like early Earth as habitable and inhabited? It's, it's tricky because, like I said, methane can be produced by both life and non-life. And methane was potentially the dominant biosignature of early Earth's atmosphere. So what we're trying to do now is we're trying to use computer models as well as studies of microorganisms that produce methane and studies of, um, for example, hydrothermal vent systems that produce methane geologically to try to understand are there ways of teasing apart biological from non-biological methane that may have dominated on early Earth and potentially early Earth-like exoplanets. Early Earth, we like to say, is the most alien world that we have geochemical data for. So we, we might as well use it as an analog for alien exoplanets. <laughs> um, yeah, that actually, it's interesting I, that 
we have the one example of a, a habitable and inhabited planet. It's very difficult, I think, for, to, for us to imagine what a habitable planet that is not inhabited actually looks like. Um, we, we just, we don't have, we don't really know what that looks like. We need to model more. Um, but, but it is fantastic, though, that you think that the Earth has been so different. It's been inhabited for most of its history, and it has been really different the whole time. And it's funny because, you know, um, it's only relatively recently that astronomers like myself have realized <laughs> that the modern Earth isn't the only Earth. <laughs> Um, and in, in, I think in earlier days, when we were thinking about designing experiments and hardware to execute those experiments, we were, I think, we were far too focused on the current state of, the, of what the Earth looks like. That is, that is changing, and I think that is an extremely, it's an extremely healthy development that's come out of increasing levels of, of communication between astronomers and planetary scientists, astrobiologists, and Earth scientists. Um, I, I am far more confident now that we can design the experiment and the tool to do that experiment successfully now than, you know, than 10 or 15 years ago. And just to build on that, actually, um, even if, we, if, we don't, if we're not thinking about life here, we can still think about the early Earth as a repository of information about how planets get built. Um, so there's, uh, in the geological literature, there's a lot of debate about, you know, when the oceans and the continents formed. And those, those two elements of the planetary system are going to be very important for thinking about habitability as well. So standing up for my geologist colleagues, there's a lot that can, you can learn about general planetary processes from looking at the early Earth and, and how planets are, are built. I think another point that I took from Jada's comment about the early Earth is at this stage, we're not really talking about very complex life. If I'm correct, uh, the addition of oxygen allowed us ultimately to build much more sophisticated biological organisms. So when we talk about searching for life on other planets, we're not necessarily dashing for, you know, the full-on uh, intelligent life with a Starbucks, uh, but actually even very small uh, microbial organisms can really strongly affect a planet and produce a biosignature. Oh yeah, that's right. I mean, microbes are great at modifying the environment. We think we're good at modifying the environment, but microbes are fantastic at it because we're, we're breathing their products right now, right? We're, we're breathing oxygen. So... You're absolutely correct when you say that we're not necessarily looking for intelligent life. Intelligent life and even just complex life, like macroscopic life that you don't need a microscope to see, might be rare. If we look at the evolution of life on Earth, we would see that life has been microbial for the vast majority of Earth's history, that we know life has been here. You would have had to go back in time with a microscope in addition to an oxygen tank, if you want to survive, to see that the planet is actually inhabited. So... All you really need is you need to detect metabolic byproducts that are going into the atmosphere. And if you have a robust biosignature that's modifying its global environment with these metabolic byproducts, then, then we can start talking about detecting biosignatures. So uh, I mean, we've taken a lot of lessons from the Earth, but there are actually seven other planets in our solar system too. And while none of them have the strong signature for life that we could detect in the atmosphere. Can we take any lessons from them? In particular, how about signatures that might look like life, but actually aren't? Are there any evidence of that in our solar system that we could use as a warning when looking at exoplanets? I want then Joe to take that one. <laughs> well, there's... Um there's the controversy with the Allen Hills meteorite, which was a Martian meteorite that landed in Antarctica. And at first, people thought that they may have found Martian microbes in this meteorite. And there was a, there was a huge amount of publicity and excitement because we thought we had discovered life that had originated on Mars. But subsequently after that, there was quite a bit of controversy. Not everyone now believes that that, in fact, is Martian microbes that were preserved in that meteorite, but perhaps some sort of non-biological mimic of microbes or some sort of earthly process may have produced those features. So I think learning from um, the Allen Hills meteorite is very important because it shows us that we might get fooled when we start to look for life on other planets. And if we're predisposed to seeing life, we, we might fool ourselves because we might think, oh, this is what life looks like. This looks like life, but maybe it's not. 
So we, we also have to be thinking about um, what are called biosignature false positives, which are non-biological processes that might mimic biosignatures. And we're spending a lot of time right now trying to think about how to tease apart true biosignatures from false positive biosignatures. We can also think about um, uh, the solar system in terms of the habitable zone concept that we introduced earlier. So uh, imagine if we were viewing our solar system from a great distance and we were looking at the habitable zone of the sun, we might see um, three planets in there. Uh, we might see Venus, we might see Earth, and we might see Mars now, depending on where you set your limits. And I think that illustrates the some of the issues that we've raised with the habitable zone, because we know Venus isn't habitable because of the atmospheric processes that are going on, it's a very thick CO2 atmosphere, and we know Mars isn't really habitable because it's a very thin atmosphere and it's very cold and geologically inactive. So that can provide us with um, you know, a warning in, in that respect. Um, and we can also look at the solar system a bit more generally in terms of the population of other star systems we have to say, is our solar system somehow weird? Um, and I. Personally, I think it is kind of weird because we found a lot of um, these these uh, these worlds that are classed as either mini Neptunes or super Earths that Archie mentioned earlier, and we don't have one of those in our solar system. And I'm really sad about that because they seem very interesting planets to study um, that that provide that transition between small rocky planets and the much larger gas giants. So. Um, even if we're not thinking about life, maybe in this context we can think about the general lessons we can learn from our solar system in terms of planets, planetary processes. Yeah, I mean, for sure. And I guess we said earlier somehow that you know the Earth defines the habitable zone, but I, actually, I want to modify that. And, and as you said, it's actually it's you know it's Venus, Earth, and Mars to tell us about the habitable, define the habitable zone. And again, like you said, it's very obvious that just being in the habitable zone is not enough to make you habitable. Um, but we, we learn a lot about, but we do, we've learned a lot about the concept of habitability though by studying um, studying planet, uh, Venus and Mars through time. Like for example, we know that Mars, um, Mars had liquid water on its surface early in its history, flowing across the surface. It was a habitable planet. So we, by understanding, by studying like what happened to Mars to make it not habitable over time, we learn a lot about what that word means, about what the word habitable means. Um, similarly for Venus, I think, Giada, you're the one who told me, I think, first like that Venus in its early history was a lot more Earth-like, and that was news to me, for sure. Um, and again, that looking at what happened for a planet to, to lose its habitable capability um, it really teaches us a lot about what we need, to, about about where to look, why to look, like what, why that thing looks, like, that planet looks like it does, and you know, just just many many things. And actually, I'm I'm really I'm really encouraged that I think that we're starting to you know break down this sort of artificial distinction between planets and exoplanets. Um, that they're just it's just getting they're just planets you know, <laughs> everywhere, and there are a great many of them. They span a huge range of diversity, far more than what we, than the ones we have in our, just the ones in our solar system, actually. It's kind of amazing how well the planet formation process actually works. My, my personal research is actually in planet formation, and, you know, and when I was an undergrad, we thought that everything had to be just right to make the solar system. The models could just barely do it. And in fact, they kind of couldn't even do that. <laughs> um, but it seems so inevitable that you would have small rocky planets close to the star, big giant gas balls further from the star, and it didn't seem like you could make any planetary system different than that, that it would be impossible. And then the first uh, exoplanets were discovered. They were Jupiters orbiting closer to their star than Mercury orbits the sun. And then Kepler came along and just exploded it. There are all sizes of planets out there at all distances. It's a spectrum. It's not kind of binary like it is in the in the solar system. Um, and in some ways, that um, given how much nature surpassed our theoretical expectations, is also one of the things that makes me sort of hopeful that we are going to succeed in finding habitable worlds out there and maybe even inhabited ones. So rolling on with that, actually, to say, while there's a lot of logic in looking for Earth-like life, because we have so much data, and in fact, 
the only data we have is Earth-like life. Is it impossible to envisage a planet very unlike the Earth supporting life, or maybe supporting very unlike Earth life? I think it's possible to envision it. For example, again, if we look at the outer solar system moons, not very much like the Earth, but potentially able to support life. But in terms of looking for life that's not like the life on the Earth, that's where it becomes problematic because we, we just don't know how to do it. Yeah, sure, we can imagine maybe a, um, some, exotic bio, bio, uh, sorry, some exotic biochemistry, but we wouldn't know how to test for it. Um, so it's, I would argue it's not necessarily scientific to actually try and, try and look for something that we wouldn't know how to detect or we wouldn't know how to find in the first place. I think that's a good answer. I think we need to start, use Earth as a starting point. Maybe someday we will find exotic life, but we can only stretch our imagination so far, I think, before we start to come up with things that might not be actually chemically or physically possible. That, that being said, um, you know, when the tools that we want to design to find Earth-like planets, or the, even the Earth through time-like planets. Um, I mean, they will give us the ability to, you know, to, to c just collect the basic data that might have the signature of weirdness of something weird in there. Um, so it's not like we won't have the capability, actually, of detecting life that was different from the Earth, but what we would have, we'd have some data that were just really weird, impossible to explain, and we'd spend, the theorists would spend, I don't know how long, just trying to, like, figure out what it meant. Um, and maybe they never could, but it's possible maybe they could too, so. So very last question from me before we turn over to the audience. We've talked about the planet, but what about the star? So does the star matter? We found a lot of planets in particular around stars that aren't so much like our own sun, in particular these red dwarfs that were mentioned earlier. And because they're small and dim, it actually makes the planets easier to find. But is that where our consideration needs to stop? Just say, okay, there are some stars where we can find planets more easily. Or do we have to take it further and say the star itself also affects the planet? And we need to consider it when talking about habitability. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Irrefutably, yes. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, and red dwarfs are, are our favorite because... As you mentioned, we can find planets around them relatively easily, and there are a lot of them out there. They're the most common type of star in our galaxy. And for me personally, I find them very interesting because of how gradually they evolve across their main sequence, like their, the main part of their lifetime, and how, how their luminosity, their brightness changes. But there are, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of things we still don't understand and are not able to properly model with, uh, with uh, red dwarfs, like flaring, for example, they're very. Some of them are very, very active and emit very high energy um, flares that might impact the surface of the planet, which would have um, deleterious effects on any life on the surface. Um, but then we're not too sure about that. There could be other other elements to the planetary system that might shield organisms uh, from from those effects. So it's it's early days, and observations and models and theories all need um, you know, are, are going to help us to, to better untangle or disentangle the effect of star and planet interactions. Yeah, and I should say, the first, the first you know, uh, potentially habitable exoplanets that we're going, we're going to be studying um, their atmospheres in detail will be around red dwarf stars. That is just, that is just, that's just the way it is because of the capabilities of the tools that we have coming up. Because as you say, they're easier. It's easier to see a small planet around a small star than a big star. Um, but that being said, I, uh, we just, they're very, those stars are very different from the sun. And there are several, we, we, this whole week we've been talking about, you know, several different reasons why that might really not be a nice place to live. Um, so I think we, we're going to study them. We absolutely have to, and we will. Um, but we can't stop there. We also need to build the, the, the capabilities and the tools to study, to study the uh, systems that are more like the solar system with, you know, an Earth-sized planet and a Sun-like star, um, because as, for the moment, anyway, that is the only you know star-planet pairing that we know for sure can be habitable and inhabited. So we, we really do we have to do we have to we have to explore the you know the, the range of things that can happen, but we also need to look for the what we are look for us look for ourselves too. It's almost the same argument with looking for exotic life um, as as looking for an exotic habitable environment. 
It's been a great discussion so far. So at this point, we're going to take some questions from our live audience here. Sarah Brothers, National Academies. So in this panel, you have really emphasized the importance of liquid water um, for, as kind of a definition of a habitable planet or a necessity of habitability. Um, but if we step back and look at the kind of the two most basic assumptions we can make, which is that life is carbon-based, that's probably the only thing we would recognize at this moment, and that it, through its processes it creates really complex molecules. Um, why water? Why not something like the liquid methane and ethane we see on Titan? Well, that, that was interesting, actually. I mean, someone was talking about that. that water is, you know, you need, I guess for, you know, for, for chemical reactions to go, um, you, you need a liquid, a solvent. Um, and water is a special. It's better than, than liquid methane because, you know, as I kind of realized today, in fact, it is liquid at a very wide range of temperatures, <laughs> um, unlike, unlike methane, for example, liquid methane. Yeah, yeah, water's frankly kind of weird, uh, you know, and, and when we think about ices as well and how, how they can exist in lots of weird exotic states, and it's just a very effective solvent. Um, and it's ubiquitous, it's very common. Um, we, we've detected it into stellar space, we detect it around, um, have we did, mm, I might not make that statement. Um, I don't know if we've detected it around other, other stars yet. We have, okay. Yeah, so we've detected it around other stars and in interstellar medium, so we know it's out there and we know it's common and we know it's effective at being a solvent. Uh, the only thing I would add is the place where we've also seen liquid methane would be um, the Saturn moon Titan. And it should be noted that, of course, it's incredibly cold to have liquid methane. And chemical reactions don't occur quickly when it's very cold. So although you could imagine another solvent that had the same three phases, so, you know, liquid, solid, and a gas on a planet, if the temperature needed to do that was very, very low, it would be hard to have fast enough reactions to build up uh, molecules and... Things. <laughs> Thank you. All right, next question. Hi, I'm Mike Wong from Caltech. As Andrew mentioned, there's been a lot of buzz in the space community around Jupiter's moon Europa and Saturn's moon Enceladus as possible habitable environments. So I was wondering, with the new telescopes that are coming online in the next uh, couple of years and decades, what are the prospects for detecting exomoons? Yeah, we um, it's that's uh, that's hard. I mean, the planet is just detecting the planets is hard enough, but the moons. Um, we did we did try a simulation with um, this uh, this Louvoir mission concept that I've been working on. Um, that is a really that is a really ambitious mission. It's a large that has a very large telescope diameter, um, and. I think we, with this, we, we did a simulation where we looked to see if we could, if you put like a warm, put a Jupiter at one astronomical unit from a, from a star, right, you know, basically where the Earth is from the sun, and had it orbited by an Earth-like moon, I call this model Endor, of course, um, um, could you tell that there was a moon there, and could you s separate the spectra, the, the light from the moon and the light from the, the, the Jupiter, the warm Jupiter? And I think we concluded that you could tell that the moon was there. You could detect it, but you couldn't cleanly separate the light from one or the other, you know, from the, the moon, from the planet. So that would, to really do that well, that's, a, that's another level generation beyond, you know, even the large Louvoir telescope that, I'm, that we've been talking about. Thanks. All right, next question. Hi, I'm Joe Renault from George Mason University, and I was curious, what do you all think that exoplanet research can teach us about the future of the Earth? That's a great question, that really is. Um, if we look at the solar system, for example, if we look at, I know I keep, the solar system's not an exoplanet, of course, but we look to Venus. Venus might be an indicator of the future of the Earth, unfortunately, and it and doesn't, doesn't look too great. Um, but again, we can, we can use the vast number of, of planets we know about and put them into a modeling framework that can help us to understand the processes that control planetary evolution. And by, by that, I mean how planets change over time. Uh, we can find planets in different stages, potentially, of their 
geochemical evolution, how their atmospheres have, have changed um, in response to um, either interior processes going on in the planet itself or from interactions with the star. So we have, a, we have a snapshot in time when it comes to the solar system at the moment. We can investigate the early Earth, but we can look to other star systems out of different ages to see how, how planets um, might have changed over time in those particular environments and make some inferences about what the future what the future might be in store for Earth. Um, but of course, we have to consider human um, influences on, on the planet as well, which is something that exoplanets at this stage can't really teach us anything about. What I think will be great about finding Earth-like exoplanets is that it will put our planet into a cosmic context where we will finally understand how precious is Earth, how common do Earths occur, how common is life, or how rare and precious is life. These are very, very deep questions that discovering other inhabited worlds will finally tell us the answers to. Yeah, I mean, you know, on the one hand, I think all of us, um, both on the stage and at this conference, we're fundamentally optimistic about that we think there are habitable planets out there. Um, and yet at the same time, I look at the solar system and I, and I think like, wow, you know, Earth, this is like... Earth, this is Hawaii. We have the best spot in the whole solar system, and everything else, everything else is not nearly as nice. So then sometimes I think, okay, maybe we are, you know, maybe we are rare. I, and I go back and forth on this. You know, are, we gonna, are there lots of exo-Earths out there? Or are there very few? Sometimes I, you know, there's so many exoplanets out there that makes me optimistic. On the hand, then I look at the solar system, and it's just not, you know, we have the best spot for sure. Um, and I think that um, actually finding out what those exo-Earths are like, what their, their surfaces are like, their conditions, their atmosphere, everything, like, that's what we need to do for, to, like, settle this for me, <laughs> you know, to find out, um, yeah, to really find out, are we, you know, are we common or are we rare? Um, and, you know, and, and for me also, too, I'm, you know, I'm interested, I'm interested in, um, I'm interested in, habitable planets that are inhabited. I'm also interested in habitable planets that are not um, inhabited, not currently inhabited, because, you know, I, I think someday they will be. <laughs> you know, so we will make them inhabited. <laughs> Thank you. Next question. Hi, Sean Domigal Goldman, NASA Goddard, and I actually have a whole series of questions that have come in from the public using the Ask NASA hashtag on Twitter and Facebook. So if you're watching this uh, live, you can also get your questions into the panel that way. Uh, the first question is actually a follow-on to the thing that was just being discussed. How many planets would we need to survey with these telescopes before we can strongly state whether life is abundant? Okay, well, I think it's actually kind of a, it's a two-stage question. I think the first thing we, we need to ask is, um, you know, of those rocky planets in the habitable zone, how many of them are actually habitable? So that's stage one, you know, that's water. Um, so say, for example, you know, 10%, if 10% of those rocks in the habitable zone actually are, you know, have habitable surface conditions, are nice and warm and wet, um, you would need to observe you would need to study about 30 of them to be sure that you would get one uh, true exo-Earth, true Earth twin at the sort of 95% confidence level. So, you know, so what we, we, what we really want to do here is we want to study, we want to be able to, to sort of characterize in many different ways, actually, um, you know, at several dozens, I'm going to say, I think several, several dozens of rocky planet candidates in the habitable zones of nearby stars, several dozens. But of course, that's just, that's stage one. That's about, is, are there, that's about finding out what the, the, the sort of the frequency of habitable conditions is. Stage two would be of those, how many of them are inhabited? And I don't know how many we need to look at to see that. We just don't know. We just don't know enough about how life arose on this planet. You know, whether it's inevitable or extremely rare or anything, it's just, psh. anyway. Sounds like we need to do the experiment, <laughs> actually observe the planets. I mean, at least one thing we do know from life on Earth is that it appears that life on Earth arose very early in Earth's history. So perhaps that means that once conditions are right for the origin of life, maybe 
maybe it's not so hard for it to occur. But again, we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen on an exoplanet. So we need to do this experiment to actually find out. Next question. Hi, it's Sonny Harmon from uh, Columbia University. I was curious, um, we've had a lot of discussion about it this week, and I was hoping you guys could recap what each of you think is the biggest hurdle in our search for and characterization of habitable and potentially inhabited planets. So we're looking for the biggest hurdle in characterizing habitable versus inhabited planets? Or both? I think just in general. In general. Just in general, yeah. It's going to be hard. We're going to need a lot of technology development. We're going to need large missions in order to do this. And so what we need in order to answer these questions of are there other habitable planets and is there life elsewhere in the galaxy, we need large missions that are dedicated to answering this question. We, we, it will be hard to do it without it because if life is not very common, we need a large sample size of Earths. And in order to get that large sample size of you know, potential Earths, you need a big light collecting bucket in order to see as many as you possibly can. Yeah, that's a great point. I guess if I was to sum it up, I would say technology, right? That's, the, that's unfortunately the biggest hurdle that we have at the moment. Um, but also in terms of life, um, origin of life, studies. Um, we, could, we could do with a lot more. Well, there's some great work already being done, um, but finding out, as Aki uh, alluded to, the conditions and the processes that allowed life to emerge on this planet would provide a huge um, boon to us, understanding the potential habitability or the potential for planets to be inhabited um, out there in the galaxy. Yeah, I think, I'm, yeah, I'm with Giada on this one, mostly. What we need is, what's the biggest hurdle? Resources. <laughs> um, because I, and we do need technology development, but we, you know, I, we, we basically know what we need to do, you know, on the, the technology development path. You know, we, we, there's a plan. Um, we just need the support and to, to do it. <laughs> so. Okay, I have a lightning round question again from the Ask NASA hashtag. So I think I'd like to just hear all the panelists' answer to this one without, you know, just your your gut reaction. In your opinion, are we more likely to find life beyond Earth on exoplanets first or in the outer part of our own solar system? I'm going to say solar system. I'm a, I'm a solar, outer solar system evangelist, as you might have picked up from the panel. <laughs> I love the solar system. I have a special place in my heart for all the solar system planets, but deep in my heart, I, I'm biased towards exoplanets. There's, there's more exoplanets than there are solar system worlds. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm going to go with Yada on that one, actually, too. Exoplanets, just because there's so many more places to look, you know. And I think I am going to, unfortunately, tie this and say solar system. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there you have it, two, two and two. And then the last question from Ask NASA. Some people are kind of ho-hum about finding microbes beyond Earth. We want to find intelligent life. So why should we be excited about finding the small stuff, too? Well, the small stuff still teaches us our place in the cosmos. It teaches us if intelligent life is rare. If we start pointing our telescopes at every, you know, potential Earth-like planet out there, and maybe we see biosignatures in their atmospheres, but we don't see any techno signatures, you know, radio signals coming from those planets, perhaps that suggests that maybe intelligent life is rare, but simple life is common. Yeah, and I guess I'll point out that, you know, big things arise from small things. So, you know, we, you know, the, it doesn't don't go to poo-pooing the bacteria. We wouldn't be here without them. <laughs> so. Well, it's been a great discussion, and I'm very pleased to have had um, the opportunity to listen to all you discuss um, these great ideas. Um, and thank you to each one of you for coming. <laughs>